Down session off on Todd Pulse from Sidey. Please remove all hats. Turn all cell phones and papers off, please. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. Come on. We're going to have a pledge and prayer. And uh, you know, I've got to say a couple extra things. We have a commissioner that's out tonight. Uh, he's sick. And we have another commissioner that's, that's back next Sunday. So um, I'm going to ask if we could have a special prayer as well for that, too, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We, uh, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we just ask you to flood this room, Lord. We search for your wisdom and guidance, Lord, Father. We, uh, we lift up our fellow commissioners, Lord. Lord, Mr. Thomas, I just ask you to just cover his family, uh, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray most of all that everything we say and do tonight, Lord, just honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Mr. Jenkins, would you please lead us in the plan?
to become dual enrollment. So last year we had about 40 to 50 kids dual enrolled in DCAT. This year we have over 400. That doesn't mean that they'll all get their credits, but they have the opportunity. We're also going to add two new courses this coming year. One is Advanced Manufacturing at Central, and that is directly aligned with Blue Oak City needs, and also Culinary Arts at Middleton High School. We are looking at some other classes that we can take teachers that are already in place and add certifications to them so it does not cost us additional positions. Another area we have focused on are industry certifications. Not every kid is going to college, and that's okay. We need to provide them the same opportunities we provide our college going students. The last two or three years, we've had maybe two to three students obtain industry certification. And what industry certifications are are things like OSHA 10, Surf Safe, something that a student or an employee can take. A student can take to an employee and say, hey, I already have these skills, and give them an upper hand potentially on the employment. Last year we had 55, this year we already have 50, and we expect that to increase even more before the end of school. So those are some things that some opportunities we're providing for our students that are not going to college. We're also looking at some things for those who are going to college. We've had two or three courses that were dual enrollment, but we're offering lots more this year, such as APT WorkKey, CLIP, ASVAB, and some other things. The most exciting part that we just signed a partnership with a few weeks ago that we're going to formally roll out next week is a partnership with Jackson State for students who are going to be juniors next year to have to meet a pre rigorous eligibility criteria. Those students can start taking classes in the morning in high school, their junior year, and if they go with it and pass everything, when they graduate from high school, they're going to receive a high school diploma and an associate's degree from Jackson State for very little cost to the school, no cost to the school district, very little cost to the parents. That's a huge opportunity for kids to get ahead. Building partnerships has been a huge priority. So those are some of the academic um, improvements that we've made, some opportunities we've had through grants, and opportunities we've had through partnerships. We've also had some funding opportunities. Um, the MA High School grant we received two years ago it focuses on three courses, digital agronomy, construction, and culinary arts. What those did was allow us to upgrade a lot of equipment and also pay for those teachers to be adjunct instructors after grants. That did not cost our general purpose dollars money, so that those savings went directly into our fund balance. That is ending in June. The other funding opportunity we've had are our ESSER funds, ESSER 1, 2, and 3, which are basically similar to your ARP that ours were a lot more restrictive, and um, they were very, we had rigorous guidelines of what we could and could not spend that on. What we were able to do was take those things that we typically run in general operations that were allowed in ESSER, use those funds out of ESSER, and it saved our general purpose dollars. Some examples of that are things like our driver's day cars. Typically, those have to come out of our bus houses every three years as required. That would allow them through ESSER, those are savings we have that we can build our fund back with. The nurses, instructional coaches, those are positions that we were able to pay dollars on. The Hope Street building, which is behind DEA, we have, um, we're in the process of beginning renovation out there. It has been city government for about 15 years. So we have the opportunity through ESSER dollars that we probably wouldn't have otherwise to renovate that facility and be able to get it up to code, get it educationally qualified and certified so that we can use that building as well. Those are the types of things we've done strategically to increase our fund balance. <clears throat> when looking at the Hope Street building, we looked at all of our other campuses as well. Seven of our schools were built between 1950 and 1965. Two of them, Middleton Elementary and Whitefield Elementary, were built between 1970 and 1980. Our schools are relatively old. Most of them are 50 plus years, and there hasn't been a lot of major renovation or improvement done. The last additions we had were in 1998. We um, have used our extra dollars, and I'll show you some examples of things that we have done with extra, which is not out of general purpose. One was almost every cafeteria got the floor, some new furniture, new paint, made a big difference in some of our schools. <coughs> the auditorium at Central, I'm pretty sure still has the same carpet in it, but it didn't want to be built. We 
So again, that, that was floor again, that painted over the chairs, painted the walls. It's much brighter, a much better place to hold functions. The community uses that. It's not just for the school. So lots of things happen there. The one on the right is one of the restrooms next to it. Simple renovation there. This is at Tate Elementary. That was a sidewalk that had become pretty hazardous. We put in a new sidewalk. All that was done through Esther. We put awnings up at Middleton Elementary and Whitehall Elementary, both similar to this. And also to the smaller ones at Bolivar Middle and Crane Junction. Early last year, I put a literary principal and walked into the building, and I came back and compiled a list. And when I got back, that list was a lot more extensive than what I thought it would be on things that we needed to work on. The, um, I talked to the board in January. We were going to leave, but we spent the first week of January going to every school, walking through it. And I'm just going to show you some of the things that we found. Those are hallways in one building. Three different kinds of floors. For various reasons, whether it was a leak, something got broken, whatever it may be, that's the floor in one facility. That carpet, I know for a fact, has been there for over 21 years. The door on the right, that's the gap between the interior and the exterior. I'm sorry, I have to put this in the um, That is the gym at Grand Junction. It actually has a plaza floor with like a rubber covering. See where it's starting to come up for the plywood is bubbling there. The restroom on the right, um, there are about 20 restrooms in that building that look just like it. We have water damage on awnings. The right is a portable that we still use for OT and PT services. Exposed pipes, hundreds of ceiling tiles, or restrooms. So I think you can see the need there for. Some, something, some improvement. The board came back and we said, okay, we've explored <coughs> options. We know we have some things we want to do, but let's explore our options. One of the options we explored was um, when we're here to talk about one of the new buildings. <coughs> we actually went through exploring that and contacted the division of local government finance. They sent us an extensive spreadsheet with a formula to be able to determine if it was even financially possible. What this formula works off of is the debt of the county. And we got the current debt at the time of the county. We figured we reached out to contractors, um, other districts that were in the process of building, got some estimates. The estimate of the new building now is in the $300 range per square foot. A minimum school now would be $50 million. Minimum. Not even sure if we do with that. But we used that as a number so that we could get a baseline. And what it did was when we plugged all the information in that the Division of Government and Finance sent to us, there's a threshold of what the debt to the county's appraisal value can be. And that ratio is of that percentage is 10%. That's the safe side. Anything below 10%, they consider a good thing. Anything above is at risk. What that would do was not only was no over $2 million annual payments, it also put the county's at the debt risk from 7% to 17%. The board didn't think that was the responsible thing to do. So we went and looked at other options. The other option was renovations. Looking at what are some things we can do, flooring, paint, some things that just make things look better, more appealing, and um, things that just make improve. There has not been a lot of physical improvement in our building in a long, long time. We were also working on a project through extra funds to replace the windows and doors. We had started at Bob Elementary, and uh, one of the reasons was one, economical, uh, economy efficiency in terms of the windows, but two, those classrooms only had, they didn't have exterior exits. When we replace windows there, we're going to replace them with escape windows. So the kids have two exits to get out of for safety reasons. But the company that was working with us, when we, when we got into doors, we got into um, structural issues. So we had to get an engineer to come in and help with that. They gave me a drawing, a draft of what an example of something that a renovation could look like. And I'm going to show you a picture of what something relatively simple could look like. But this is not what it's going to look like. This is just an example. But this is what Bob Elementary could look like with just a simple porticos. That's it. The paint trim, porticos, and everything. 
not relatively high cost, but big impact. There's a rendering of the ADP building. Again, these are just draft examples, but huge impact. Why would we be looking at this? What we're remembering is resolution for educational capital fund capital projects fund. This is a three to five year plan. It is not even the infancy stages yet. It would not be quick. You know how difficult projects like that can be, how time consuming it can be. But what this would do is it would move four million dollars from our fund balance into our general purpose capital improvement project fund. Uh, this would be for things such as restrooms, flooring, paint, outdoor facades, landscape, <coughs> and lighting, things like that. Our board did approve this in a, at the April meeting. And one of the things we're thinking about and the reason we think this is important is one, look at all the city's coming. And I talked to mayors and one of the things that they say first is sometimes when businesses come in, what do you think one of the first things they ask about? Is? They want to know academic <coughs> work on improving that. And they want to see them. I encourage you to have not been around our campuses lately to go look at them. These, this would help the county be more attractive. It also is important for our citizens who are already here. They deserve to have, um, to be proud of it, to have something that students are proud to come to and to see. Uh, I'm going to pass out the resolution and let you read it. Exactly. The name, I don't know the name of the company, but they're like energy management companies. Were they look at doing changing out the lights and insulation? Were they able to come up with any, any they ideas? They do not want to give you any real figures until you sign a contract with them. <laughs> um, I didn't want to sign a contract until I had the potential projects. Um, they do have some savings, and there's also some low interest, very low interest loans available for that. Right. That can be part of this. I can tell you that a lighting project would be easily <coughs> touching. So this would be something very. We would have to go with something like that. Actually, was, was, the, was the lighting not changed out at some schools a few years ago? It was. Yes. What are, how many years ago?
athletics in the school system as well. Your extra careers are it's very important. Maybe a little important. Maybe my kids are involved in it. I don't know. But uh, regardless, I, I think there's definitely a need there at some point. I don't know what that wish list is. It's, uh, it's probably pretty big for sure. But I'd like to see somehow, some way, if y'all's bored to approve some money to go to athletics. And I'm talking about from golf to football. We actually have a plan for that. Um, <coughs> there's four majors, and it, it was relatively small, but we have a plan in place. We can increase it later. If need be, last year we had the four majors board at each school. Well, I think we had $30,000 budgeted for that. That has been dispersed this year. I believe it's some of the middle school major sports next year will be the things like golf, tennis, those, those smaller sports. Then it would start over. Um, we do have a plan. $30,000 doesn't go a long way when you're looking at six different things. Well, just like what we talked about with the school board over the Center, you know, just the little things. And you, you mentioned the community. That's where the community is going to buy in to the school system. Friday night football, Tuesday, Thursday night basketball. That's where the community is going to rally and support the school systems. So you got to keep, I don't mean to harp on athletics because there's a lot more to education than athletics, but that's definitely an area of interest that needs to be addressed at some point. But I will say, again, this is exciting news and, and wish you the best with it. I'll, I'll support it 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is, this is a once in a lifetime. We will never see this opportunity. Two grants like that back to back that have allowed us to strategically build our fund out. Our fund out is going to build like this in the future. It's just not. This is just, it's just one of those great times we're in that we're not going to, in three years it's going to be gone. And we're trying to make sure we have a three to five year plan that we can sustain several different initiatives and things and do these types of upgrades to get us where we want to be. I'll get closer. And on these funds, I would like to know what do the do the principal have to apply or ask for uh, the community? I would love to for this, this for, stuff for, for the stuff for like for the schools, the academics or whatever they want to try to apply to have a school to uh, I can speak for my my district nine, Grand Junction. We don't have any Grand Junction don't have any. Academics, just PE there in school. Right. They have no basketball, no, no little league, anything for the kids. Um, we're actually working on your auxiliary for general purpose, not for this. One of the issues with sports in Antonio is it's hard to find coaches now. Uh, if you work with little league or any of these things, it's really difficult to find coaches. I like to say I am out of Chris, did you need a, res uh, a motion to accept this resolution from this commission? We did need to Okay, at uh, this time I'd like to make a motion to accept this resolution that uh, Dr. Smith has presented to this commission. Motion has been made.
but they want they don't want you to study. They want you to show them. Beginning. I can I can yeah. see it. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is for the upcoming day. No, that's I just asked that. The way it's stated, 2324. Well, this is correction on the last. This is 2323 is what it's supposed to be. I'm sorry. If y'all, if you'll get the, I can get a copy. Maybe y'all just approve it as long as we say 2022, 2023. We haven't approved 23 and 24 y'all. Correct. That's fine. Yeah. Say as amended. Yeah. But anyway, that's the correct one. 22 and 23. Okay. All right.
first one. There is a correction on the on the debit line item. The fund should be 122, which is the drug shares drug fund. Uh, account number 39,000, which is drug fund fund balance. Debit 13,000 and credit to uh, 54,157,18, uh, which is the uh, drug fund on the expenditure side. <coughs> Credit me thirteen thousand for a two thousand fifteen Chevy Tahoe, and it comes with a positive recommendation for the budget. Question: I know in the past we moved money from that fund. That is okay to go towards the Tahoe. Yes. Shelton and the Planning Commission, Mr. Deaver is on that. If you have any questions for either one of them, I think we'll be prepared to address Before we do that, we need to convene into a public hearing uh, quickly on this matter. And this will address the, this resolution. Maybe we can go into public hearing. 
in some counties don't have the funding in their budget this year, so they're moving it to the next year and year after, which is perfectly fine. It's just it's what how you guys want to approach what we're flexible. Would that help for the parking lot as well? Yes, so we can replace the uh, okay. inch and a half resurfacing uh, sidewalks if we have any ADA issues, anything yeah. on that property we can address. It. Anybody have any, any questions? questions? So, so is there actually a list of, of items that y'all are going to address yes. that's available yeah. to us? Yes, we do have and Janelle and I, we, we visited with staff and we've had the, we had a, a first phase probably two years ago, that was before you were, I was able to give the county $325,000 to renovate and that was 100% state funded, but we didn't get to do all the things we wanted to do. We had to cut some things out, so we want to go back in there and finish the job correctly. So. And I recently priced my furniture, and it's going to be almost $60,000. The furniture entire has been yeah. So a year ago, when we donated $100,000 for the new roof, does that count for this? No, unfortunately, it had to come after March of uh, this year. Have we completed the roof? The yes, roof is completed. Yeah. And so far, it's, it's all went well. I haven't heard of it. It's leaking. Is it leaking again? It's leaking. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
step out um, this way a little bit. We have someone here in special attendance as well. Um, <coughs> proclamation recognizing Blue and Green Day in the South. Whereas every year National Donate Life observes Blue and Green Day to amplify the importance of registering as an organ and tissue donor, encourage the public to wear blue and green to raise awareness. And whereas more than 100,000 Americans, including 4,000 in the Mid-South area, are currently on the National Transplant waiting list. Whereas another person is added to the waiting list every nine minutes, and on average 17 people die every day because the organs they need are not donated in time. Whereas we can do our part to save lives by educating and encouraging our peers and loved ones to register as an organ and tissue donor. Whereas we hold these, that they have saved lives through the gift of donation to the highest regard and are grateful for their selflessness. Now, therefore, I'm Todd Foles, Mayor of Hardwood County, here by proclaim, and this was last week, as the 10th day of April, uh, in honor of Blue and Green Day in Mid South, Hardwood County. Encourage all residents to promote the importance of organ and tissue donations. I have a year to set my hand and cause to be fix the seal of Hardwick County today. And uh, I want to recognize someone very special here, a lifelong friend of mine. She is a double transplant recipient, two heart transplants. Why don't you come up, please?
and celebrating his unique characteristics of the drivers, which helped him immediately discover their own uh, resilience. And is there anyone here right now? Okay. On the agenda, you'll see um, th this is the last one for, uh, for us. Uh, this is for autism. Uh, there was another one for uh, Linda Fulger, you know, that passed away. She was the longest serving elected official uh, in Tennessee at the time. Uh, she passed. She had been in office, uh, you know, she retired, I guess, over 50 years. Um, the family had asked me to wait till next month and they could all be here so that we could present the proclamation to them. So, out of respect for their wishes, uh, we will not have that tonight. We will have it next month. And, uh, for now, I'd like to read something, please. This is our own proclamation. Um, Julian, would you like to come up, please, sir? National Autism Awareness Month. Whereas, in honor of April, as National Autism Awareness Month, Hardin County, Tennessee, we like to take steps to increase awareness and understanding of the disorder. And whereas autism is a result of a neurological disorder, he calls it wide range impairments in social communication and, and, and repetitive behaviors and can affect anyone. Whereas autism is the fastest growing development disability in the United States affecting more than 3 million people per year. Whereas in recognition of the growing needs of autism and the need to provide services to help individuals and families who are affected, whereas Hardin County is honored to take part in the annual observation and observance of Autism Awareness Month and hope that it will lead to a better understanding of the disorder now, therefore, I, Todd Coles, Mayor of Hardin County, do hereby proclaim April as Autism Awareness Month to raise public awareness of autism and the numerous issues surrounding <coughs> autism. I'd like to present this to uh, Mayor Julian McTizzy. <coughs> diagnosis a level three autism I think a couple weeks ago uh, he's uh, the greatest kid you ever meet uh, in his mind he's perfect and his us that's different uh, so thank you for this and I'll just say uh, pray for any family that's affected by this uh, but it's a very very unique thing and it's a blessing and we count as a blessing that God will give us a special child like Jewel so thank you that's all that thank you guys for uh, acknowledging it. thank you Mayor several lawsuits uh, that are being defended by either a lawyer retained by the insurance company or a lawyer hired by Core Civic. Because the agreement with Core Civic is that when the county is sued in one of their lawsuits, they provide the attorney for that. And uh, I can go into the names of those real quick. Uh, one, this one is uh, still pending and the insurance company has hired uh, a lawyer in Jackson and Chris Hayden to defend it. I think the uh, Pentecost firm had a conflict and that's Joy versus Sunny, uh, it's, uh, it's John for Joy, I believe. Uh, there's another one involving uh, Jeffrey Joy that settled uh, this past week. And then there's a, a 
Lawler versus Hartman County case, and that's on appeal to the Sixth Circuit because Judge Anderson denied the uh, motion for qualified immunity, and you can appeal that issue to the Sixth Circuit even though the case is uh, still out there. And that's being defended by uh, Nathan Philly with the Pentecost firm. And then there are the three, what I call the Piccolo Lake lawsuits. Uh, one of those is uh, it's docket number 19631. It was dismissed because the chancellor found that the uh, BZA's approval of the application was not preceded by uh, by recommendation by the regional planning commission. So that case is done, and there are two others. And the next step of those is to file the transcripts of the of the uh, hearings, and then the, all the exhibits with uh, with the chancery court, and then the chancery court will uh, will decide on those whether the uh, whether the uh, action by the uh, planning commission was active or not. Uh, and then, of course, the TDEC lawsuit uh, brought by the administrator of the suit, that's been resolved. And, uh, and then there's Eddie Tardy versus Core City. Again, that's being defended by, uh, uh, by a lawyer hired by Core City. It's not even that the county is responsible for it. And the only thing I do on those cases is occasionally somebody calls me one of the lawyers to tell me what's going on with it, I'll check it. But I don't, uh, I don't feel afraid of that because that's been handled by other attorneys. And the uh, last case, uh, we had to, uh, Mr. Pierce is still here, we had to uh, take Andrew Jimenez to court. He built a building, and I don't remember the exact location of it. Mr. Pierce is here, he can tell you. But uh, Mr. Jimenez had uh, he built a building without getting the proper permits, and then as a result of that, he didn't have his, uh, his outline for how the building was going to be put, where it's going to be. So it's too close to the right of way. And so the, we filed a complaint for mandatory injunction. Uh, Chancellor Cole granted that. And uh, Mr. Jimenez ended up moving the building back to satisfactory with uh, Mr. Pierce. So that lawsuit was just waiting for him to get a final order and they're dismissing it. It was just something they had to do because he ignored uh, uh, Mr. Pierce's predecessor when she contacted him about him not getting the proper uh, permits. And then he continued that with. Uh, with Mr. Pierce and had a patient report to his attention. The building's been moved down and all that's taken care of now. Yes, thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, where was that location at? <coughs> on the human house? Yes. It was on uh, 64 East Morning in town uh, and the old Westers. Thank you. And he at one time had a trailer on there that somebody was living in, uh, but he'd, he'd already taken care of that and moved that out. So. Yes, sir. Um, talking about the lawsuits, our, our last meeting we discussed, uh, and I made a motion to uh, reject the uh, offer on the Perry lawsuit. I don't believe that there's a commissioner sitting up here that doesn't feel that these people are owed money, including myself. They're owed money. And um, just because we reject something doesn't mean that we're not open to listen and talk about something. With that being said, tonight, I would like to make a motion that we offer to settle this lawsuit for $1.2 million. Yeah. 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 Okay, there has been a motion made uh, by Commissioner Grant. Is there a, is there a second?
a motion to second on the floor. If there's no more discussion, uh, we do need uh, to have a question. Mm -hmm. They come together and accept, say that they do accept it. That's all we make the process. Okay. So we do not need a roll call vote. We need to vote on this uh, to authorize. He made a motion to, to settle it, so we yeah. need to approve that motion. Yeah, yeah, he got to approve uh, that. We need to roll call vote. He said, and I quote, 
I tell you the truth, Richard, we did not have the money. I said, what about these lawsuits that might end up costing us over 500000 and maybe a few million? He said, and I quote, we have plenty of money for these lawsuits. At that time, I knew I was wasting my time. I went to another one of my commissioners complaining about the legal fees we were facing. After some discussion, he got a little upset. I informed him that another commissioner had told me the county had plenty of money for the lawsuit. I said the county did not have plenty of money. He said the county did not have plenty. I suggested he inform the commissioner I had just talked to. There was another commissioner not in my district that I thought I could reach him with. After some, some discussion, I asked him if he would make a motion at the next meeting to settle this lawsuit and cut our losses. I have been told he now wants to fire the attorney I knew there as hired and rehire the attorney from Covington. We have already paid the attorney from Covington several hundred thousand dollars in legal fees and what have we accomplished? We could have buried that money in the landfill and had the same result. What you heard of the legal fees you have put on the back of the taxpayers since I talked to you? Our new attorney has expertise in labor law. I did not know much about labor, how much knowledge she had about labor law. Our former attorney told these commissioners they had better settle this lawsuit or it could cost the taxpayers at least $500,000 and maybe in the media and possibly bankrupt the county. The commissioners did not accept Chip Pierce's advice and they were paying him for legal advice. I cannot imagine anyone not following the advice of their attorney. I am told some commissioners have said they are going to bank that like they are not going to bankrupt this county, but they are going to let the judge bankrupt this county. The judge has beat you to the punish. He turned this case Case over to you and our turn to negotiate a settlement. It was very apparent we did not negotiate in good faith, and the judge is not going to like it. <clears throat> Your constituents are not going to accept this explanation. They did not elect the judge to manage this county. They elected you to manage this county, and they are going to hold you accountable for these expenses. The citizens of this county are smart enough to know that the former mayor and county commission are the ones who refuse to negotiate the settlement and then continue to run up the attorney fees and the amount of the judgment for the plaintiffs. The citizens will look at the legal expenses and how they have grown from the beginning of the lawsuit to now. When the commissioners let the former mayor hire another attorney, they had voted 14 to 1 to settle the lawsuit. That is the day the commissioners stopped representing their constituents and started following the advice of the former mayor. <coughs> Last month, the commissioners voted 78 to not settle the lawsuits we are facing. I understand the county voted, <coughs> voted on these almost $6 million. I was told the county has $7,750,000 7 in reserve. $6 million represents 57% of the annual taxes we take in a year. I want to thank you, commissioners, that voted to settle this lawsuit. I think we, you were very really wise. Tonight, I hope and pray that one of you commissioners will change your vote so the mayor can notify our new attorney we are ready to settle this lawsuit and get on with the other issues facing this county. I hope all of you know that the county cannot take from bankruptcy and the judge cannot bankrupt the county. If our finances get bad enough, the state controller will come down and set our tax rate to make sure our county is financially sound. I want what is best for Hardin County and I really think you do too. Let's settle this and end this madness. Mr. Mayor, thank you for letting me I want to wish you the best. I also hope when you get a little down and a little discouraged, you will go to God and ask Him for a little, little wisdom that He gave King Solomon. You may also want to pray that one of these commissioners will change their vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clayton.
Yes, uh, commissioners, we have we have a card that we'd like for you to sign up with Commissioner Polk, and we have him here. If you could, please.